Hello, everybody. This is John from Learning Herbs, and welcome to the Herb Mentor Live that we're doing today. With me is herbalist Rosalie de la Forêt, and Rosalie is an author of two amazing herbal books, Alchemy of Herbs, Wild Remedies. She's a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild. She has some amazing courses, online courses that she runs. Um, and uh, she's with us here today. I'm going to do answer your questions. We're going to talk about what is chronic inflammation and two amazing herbs that can help you with that. We're going to go in depth into that, as well as to answer your questions. We're here for all of the Herb Mentor members. We're glad you're with us today. So with me here is Rosalie. How are you? Hello, John. Hello, everyone. It's fun to see everyone logging in from all over. Never ceases to amaze me how... People get to join us from all over the world. So welcome, know, everybody. It's incredible. It's incredible. So, so Rosalie, um, I know we're talking about inflammation. Things are getting hot out there. Is it hot there where you are in Twisp? It's getting oh my warm. gosh, it's so hot. It's actually a little bit overcast today. So I think today's our respite. But man, it's going to be you know over 100 degrees this next week, which is oh pretty intense. Um, wow. Wow. It might even get up, up to like maybe 70 here where I live. So that's <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I was thinking it would get a lot warmer there too. A little, a little bit, a little bit. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, finally summer is uh, so it's coming here. Um, so a lot of folks coming here, coming on. Wow, Angela, Angela from uh, Georgia, Vicky from Jacksonville. I lived in Jacksonville when I was four years old for a year. Almost oh, grew up there. I didn't know, I know. That. Yeah, I know. I was like four years old. My dad got transferred to Florida. I almost grew up Floridian, but luckily they moved back to New Jersey and everything is okay. <laughs> uh, Toronto, Catherine, Brenda, Texas, Wisconsin, Deborah, Allison, um, Mex New Mexico, Jerry, and some familiar faces coming on here. Wow, a lot of folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and oh, from Galway. Wow, Jerry Kent, Galway, Ireland. I'd been there. I was lived there for a year in County Galway in 1994. I almost went back, remember, Rosalie, last year. I was supposed to go back to Galway, County Galway, last year, uh, my 50th birthday. But with pandemic, that all got canceled. So maybe I'll make it back there and I'll run, and I'll run into Jerry. Amy from Jersey. All right. Where in Jersey? All right. Karen from, from Eugene. Nice. Menlo Park. Kim from Nantucket. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, Rosalie, um, our mentor live, this is something, you know, you just never know when we're going to do it. We really don't <laughs> have a plan. There's no schedule. We're just like, should we do one? And we're like, yeah. And we just find that's just a lot more fun for us that way and a lot more spontaneous. And so you just never know. And so if you are watching um, here, which of course you are, it's live. Um, uh, you could uh, ask questions, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, put it in the little chat. Um, that window and not like in the messenger area, but in the chat and it'll come into our feed here. Um, so yeah. And, um, and anyone to replays, um, if you can't watch the whole thing or want to get back to it, it's just going to be where you're watching it. Now the replay will work right away after we're finished here. Um, so get that out of the way too. <laughs> so, um, so it's 103 here. And Rosalie, um, how would you like to start? Um, would you want to? Well, I was actually today? thinking, so we're talking about inflammation today, like you said, John, and this, this like right now is all about inflammation. It's the summertime. It's the summer of heat, which is inflammation. And some of you might know, I have another webinar going on um, this week as well. And I saw someone mention that they, Lori says that um, she already enjoyed the webinar earlier today. So Lori, that's a lot of Rosalie today. Thanks for coming yeah. for more. And uh, so I'm wondering if there's other people out there who've already watched the webinar, or who are already signed up, you could just hit that in the chat because it'd be lo lovely to see that. And I wanna let you know that today's presentation is different from the webinar that's going on. I created it to be complimentary. So you might of course see similar themes because they're both about chronic inflammation, but I hit different information for this one and different information in the webinar. So if this is yeah. something that interests you, you're going to like them both. And I talk about entirely different herbs. So it's definitely like if this is, if chronic inflammation is something that you're curious about, this is the place to be. And you're going to like that webinar too. Yeah, and we yeah, want to like a special. lot of people. Oh, Lori, <laughs> that was nice. We, uh, we wanted to uh, do something special for those who 
our, did see the webinar, your the, um, inflammation webinar. And you know, a, this could be a place where you might have a question because you can ask live questions on the other one. And also this is something special for Herb Mentor members because we put the Herb Mentor live out and we wanted to give you something different, something extra for you. And uh, this will be a great presentation. And if you, uh, and then you're going to want to see the other presentation which is running right now. And we'll put the, um, we'll put the, uh, the, um, from time to time, but simply herbwebinar.com. You go to herbwebinar.com. You can just pop it up in a new window right now and just register for later today or tomorrow, and you can watch it and get like a, a fuller um, presentation. But today we're gonna focus on a small topic, and then as well as questions, whether you have questions from today or questions from the webinar that you watched earlier. Um, so what should we do now, Rosalie? Should we just get going? Yeah, let's jump into it. So I love seeing all the comments here. First, though, I guess, is um, um, people pointing out the herbs that were in, in the other ones, stinging nettles. Um, people love mm -hmm. the morning webinar. People are signed up. So yay. <laughs> this is definitely yeah. an exciting time. So thanks, everyone, for your enthusiasm and for watching. And um, and we'll keep, you know, we'll keep sharing that link. But really, what's most important now to settle in for this presentation. And again, whether you've seen the other one or you're gonna see the other one, this one has different information that I'm excited to share with you. So let's jump in, John, you can okay, put my slides up great. there. And, and uh, uh, full screen layout, there we go. Perfect, so we need to start in the beginning, right? What is inflammation? Well, this is really your body's process of fighting off illness, injury, and other negative effects. And a lot of the time, inflammation gets a bad rap, but it's actually something that's really good. It's your body's defense mechanism, and it's part of the healing process. So I really want to accentuate all inflammation isn't bad. And if we want to be like kind of simplify things, we can break inflammation into two categories, and that's acute and chronic. So here's a diagram showing some of the different ways that acute and chronic inflammation show up. So as you can see, acute inflammation is a lot about injuries, whether that's cuts, sprains, burns, could be bug bites. And acute inflammation, it can definitely be uncomfortable, but it's rarely dangerous. In fact, as I just mentioned, it's often a good thing because it means your body is doing what it needs to do in order to heal. Chronic inflammation, however, is a big problem. So many chronic illnesses that are plaguing us today are rooted in chronic inflammation. Every day, thousands of people are diagnosed with these diseases, and every day, thousands of people are dying from these diseases. And that's very frustrating, and it's very heartbreaking. We know what's causing many of these serious diseases but honestly, we aren't doing a very good job of actually treating them. Western medicine is still searching for magical pills to cure diseases instead of treating the root cause. Obviously, Western medicine can come up with some pretty cool things, you know, like surgery still totally blows my mind, but they don't really have a good track record when it comes to actually curing disease. Many of their pills simply suppress symptoms rather than heal. And alternative mes medicine doesn't actually do that much better. Too often they accentuate the negative and then they base their motivations and solutions on fear. The end result is that people are worried and fearful of everything around them. Their lives become smaller and smaller as they try to avoid all the toxins and other fearful things that they keep hearing about. So of course, I don't deny that pollutants or toxins exist, but I think a lot of the time we've gone too far. You know, especially if someone is living in constant fear of foods and just regular daily life activities. I mean, do these look like the faces of good health? And do we want to base our health choices on fear and from a place of fear? Obviously not. So that's why my approach to chronic inflammation is different. It's not about finding some non-existent miracle pill because obviously that just doesn't exist. And it's not about using fear tactics which result in people living smaller and smaller lives because they're afraid of everything. 
Instead, my approach is about living more. By bringing herbs and other naturally healing practices into your life, you can reverse chronic inflammation and live a life with more ease and less pain. Instead of focusing entirely on eliminating foods and activities, we train for them. So as you get stronger, your life experiences are able to grow instead of shrink. And lucky for us, our beloved herbs are the perfect place to start. So for today's Herb Mentor Live, I'm gonna share two wonderful herbs that are powerful allies against chronic inflammation. Let's begin with lemon balm. It's a favorite of so many. It has a delicious taste and it's wonderfully calming. It's gentle and safe enough for kids, and it works powerfully enough for adults. Energetically, it's both cooling and aromatic. This herb is wonderful for excess heat and excitation, which are traditional ways of describing inflammation. So let's look more closely at lemon balm's gifts. Lemon balm is calming, and it's a wonderful way to promote sleep. Did you know that many kinds of insomnia are actually caused by inflammation? Well, one study looked at the combined benefits of lemon balm and Nepeta menthoides. That's a mint that's closely related to catnip. The study showed that people taking the herbal formula had decreased levels of insomnia, as well as lowered levels of depression and anxiety. I mentioned earlier that chronic inflammation is believed to be the underlying cause of many diseases, including Alzheimer's. An interesting lemon balm's ability to modulate inflammation and to gently calm has been shown to help patients with Alzheimer's. Several clinical trials in the early 2000s looked at the benefits of lemon balm for people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. One trial showed that those taking lemon balm extract had less agitation than those taking a placebo. Another showed that those using lemon balm aromatherapy had improved quality of life, reducing the time they spent socially withdrawn and increasing time spent in constructive activities. So of course, lemon balm isn't a cure for this devastating disease, but it does offer a lot of benefits for improving the quality of life for people with Alzheimer's. In addition to soothing stress and agitation and promoting sleep, lemon balm has long been an herb to support cognitive health, or as Maud Grieve wrote in the 1930s, to strengthen the brain. In one small 2018 pilot study, 44 healthy people with an average age of 61 were given either a combination of sage, rosemary, and lemon balm, or a placebo for two weeks. And then they were asked to perform word recall tests to measure memory enhancement. The study indicated that this mint family formula was more effective than a placebo and improving memory recall. And the researchers called for more studies to look at lemon balm's effects on broader cognitive health. Lemon balm has also been shown to have benefits for young, healthy adults. In one small trial, participants given lemon, lemon balm had better accuracy and attention and rated themselves as more calm. Lemon balm has also been shown to help people with type 2 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes often has a lot of issues with chronic inflammation. A clinical trial showed that lemon balm is safe and effective in improvement in lipid profile, glycemic control, and the reduction of inflammation in patients with type 2 diabetes. You know, herbs rarely do one thing, and lemon balm not only helps with chronic inflammation, but can also help with acute inflammation. So many years ago, I was out hiking in an old growth forest with a group of people. I was in the Pacific Northwest, and we were following this overgrown trail. It was covered with these giant ferns and other undergrowth, so you couldn't really see what was going on on the ground. And while we were enjoying those giant trees towering above us, someone accidentally stepped on a wasp's nest. And we were quickly surrounded by these powerful stinging insects. I escaped, but I got a handful of nasty stings in the process. And yes, if you're wondering, those wasps were really that big. I kid you not. 
So I'm there, I'm in this forest, I've got stung by wasps, they're really painful. And so I looked around for plantain. I'm sure a lot of you know that plantain is really famous for soothing bug bites and stings, but I couldn't find any plantain. And instead growing all along this trail was lemon balm. It's not a native plant there, but it just had gone feral and it was all along the trail. So I thought, well, that's what I have is lemon balm. I know this is a safe plant. I know lots of plants can help with stings. So I went for it. I chewed it up, I applied it to the stings, and then I just watched in amazement as the pain and swelling was greatly reduced. And so that was just kind of a thing, something I stumbled upon. And at that time, I didn't actually know that lemon balm has a long history of use for topical relief of bites and stings. Dioscorides, who lived from 40 to 90 AD, wrote in his classic book, De Materia Medica, a decoction of lemon balm leaves is good for those touched by scorpions or bitten by harvest spiders or dogs. <laughs> so I'm glad I haven't had to deal with that yet, but it was great for those wasp stings. And it just shows how versatile this plant can be in helping both with acute and chronic inflammation. One of the most surprising studies I've come across ever really <laughs> was a study that looked at the benefits of using lemon balm to protect people who are often exposed to x-rays. And you know, this is important because the radiation from x-rays can damage DNA and induce oxidative stress. So in this study, 55 radiology staff members were asked to drink lemon balm tea twice a day for 30 days. Oxidative stress markers were recorded before they began drinking the tea. And then after the 30 days, they were tested again. The researchers recorded numerous improvements in oxidative stress markers, including a marked reduction in plasma DNA damage. That's really cool. So when I read this study, several things occurred to me. One, I was like, wow, didn't know that about lemon balm. But also, I bet there's a lot of plants that would do this, right? It's just that they happen to study lemon balm in this study. Then I thought, well, why isn't every radiologist everywhere drinking lemon balm tea every day, right? <laughs> it seems like a common thing, you know, that's where my mind goes. But then I'm thinking, so many of us are exposed to radiation, whether it's just, you know, occasionally because we go to the dentist or other medical reasons, or even when we fly, you know, when we're up really high in airplanes, we are exposed to more radiation. So basically all of us can benefit from taking lemon balm. And I also want to say this because this kind of goes to my earlier point is that it's pretty hard for us to completely avoid radiation. As I mentioned, we use it in the medical field, we get it if we fly. So the goal isn't to hide in our homes, you know, fearful and locked away from radiation, but instead, of course, we wanna take reasonable cautions while also inviting wonderful therapies like lemon balm into our lives so we can help protect our bodies against normal exposure. All right, moving on. Lemon balm also protects the skin. You know, ultraviolet or UV radiation is one of the leading causes of skin cancer and photo aging, which are changes to the skin, which is induced by chronic exposure to sunlight. Well, this in vitro study showed many benefits from lemon balm for protecting the skin, including a decrease in UVB induced oxidative stress production and a reduction in UV induced DNA damage. So basically all those big words means it really helps protect your skin. So, you know, too often people, I know no one here, but too often people think of herbs as like antiquated or irrelevant in the modern world, but obviously nothing can be further from the truth. As you can see, lemon balm helps us in so many ways, whether it's helping us to calm and soothe our nervous system, help us to sleep, protecting us against things like radiation or UV induced DNA damage. Lemon balm is definitely a powerful herb for all of us today. Lemon balm is so lovely when it's fresh. And if you want to prove yourself as a gardener, then plant lemon balm. It will flourish no matter what, pretty much. <laughs> it flourishes with neglect. Uh, so it grows so well that I actually recommend that you grow it in a container because then it, that stops it from spreading everywhere. I mentioned it was growing in that old growth trail. Most likely it had escaped from somebody's garden. 
And what I like to do is I grow it in a container and I keep it close by so that I can crush and smell the leaves often, uh, pop a leaf in my mouth, and then I can easily pinch it off and enjoy this as a fresh herb tea as well. And there's really so many lovely things that you can uh, do and work with lemon balm. Uh, you can, as I mentioned, it can be a fresh herb tea, it can be a dried herb tea. You can have a little bit of lemon balm and steep it for a little amount and it's wonderfully calming. You can take a lot of lemon balm and steep it for a longer amount and then it's profoundly calming and really wonderful for the whole nervous system. You can infuse it into oil to protect the skin, add it to foods. I mean, the choices just go on and on. It's really, it's tastes lovely. So there's just so many wonderful things to do with it. There's my suggested dosages for lemon balm. The tea, again, it varies. You can have a little bit or a lot. And the best way to figure that out is to take lots of lemon balm tea and see what you prefer. Usually it's not that you just prefer one or the other, but different times of day or different moods or different times of year, whatever the case may be, might determine how strong you want your lemon balm tea. You can also use it as a tincture. Highly prefer this as a fresh herb tincture. And you know, dose the ratio is generally one to two with fresh herbs. Alcohol doesn't need to be high, it can be about 45%. And you can take this pretty liberally throughout the day. Lemon balm is very safe for children and adults. Like all plants, you wanna get it from a clean area. I know some of you might be wondering about lemon balm and thyroid because there's a lot of information about there. This is definitely a bit of a controversy in the herbal world. So what happened is like, like late 70s and early 80s, there was some studies done. These studies were not well designed. They were in vitro, which means they were like done in a lab in a Petri dish. And then there was also some pretty cruel animal studies done where they took freeze dried lemon balm and injected intravenously, you know, those into rats in huge amounts. And, and um, so these poorly done studies were done. And then these poor conclusions came out saying that lemon balm may negatively affect the thyroid. The truth is that has never been shown in humans. Of course, people can have idiosyncratic reactions, which means they can have unique reactions, but many herbal practitioners use lemon balm with people who've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism with no problem. Um, I definitely think if somebody has an underactive thyroid, then I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, drink quarts of lemon balm tea every day, but there's really no proof that that is a harmful effect there. So when people tell me that they're, you know, afraid of lemon balm because they have hypothyroid, I, I just don't see the anything to support that. All right, so that's lemon balm. And now let's talk about this other wonderful mint, rosemary. So rosemary is a small evergreen woody shrub and its native habitat is all across the Mediterranean region. And it thrives there in these super harsh conditions and really rocky soils. But then of course it grows really well in lots of our gardens, right? So it, it can grow in many different places. And as I mentioned, it's a mint, just like lemon balm. It has a wonderfully pleasing scent that's very different, of course, from lemon balm. So what's interesting to compare these two mint family plants is that they have so much in common um, while also having their unique gifts as well. Well, of course, we've long loved rosemary. It's a plant that's so easy to love. And researchers also love rosemary and they've taken an interest in looking at how rosemary can boost cognition or brain health and as an antioxidant. And that's really, that second one is really interesting because rosemary is so high in antioxidants that it's sometimes called the queen of antioxidants. And to show you why this is so important, I'm gonna take a closer look at oxidative stress and free radical damage. And this is really relevant to this presentation on chronic inflammation because there's this ongoing cycle between oxidative stress and chronic inflammation where they just feed each other. So it's like as oxidative stress rises, chronic inflammation rises, and as chronic inflammation rises, oxidative stress rises and on and on and on. So these two are very closely linked and they have a lot about what we're talking about today. So, just talk about this very briefly. What happens with a free radical is 
that if you have a stable molecule, it has paired electrons. Free radicals happen when there's an electron leakage and one of those paired electrons is you know, no longer paired. That creates a free radical. And the, the more this occurs, the stronger it affects your healthy cells. So you have your normal cell there, then you have these cells that have, are, have free radicals that are bouncing around, causing problems, it starts to damage your cells and then cells get worse and worse with that oxidative stress, which causes a lot of problems, which is believed to be a big part, underlying part of chronic inflammation and chronic disease. I do wanna mention that free radicals are just a normal part of life. You, you can't just avoid them entirely, but what's really cool is their relationship with antioxidants. We basically want to balance them out. So free radicals, they're caused by normally, normal daily activities, like just breathing can cause free radicals to happen. Of course, there's things like pollution, smoking, food toxins, those can cause free radicals as well. Then on the other hand, we have antioxidants. Our body produces antioxidants as internal enzymes, but we can also get antioxidants externally from foods and herbs. So the problems arise when we have too many free radicals in relationship to antioxidants, right? So that balance gets tipped and that causes oxidative stress. The solution to fixing this is to decrease the free radicals and increase antioxidants. All right, so remember how I said that free radicals occur when a stable cell loses an electron, right? That's that electron linkage, it's losing that electron. Antioxidants stop that process by giving an electron to the unpaired electron. So it like basically restores the damage that's been done and stops that free radical process causing the oxidative stress. So that's why we need those antioxidants to balance out the free radicals. And that's why regularly including herbs high in antioxidants like rosemary is so important. If you simply tried to decrease free radicals without increasing antioxidants, that's when your life gets smaller and smaller. And actually, in fact, it's just not possible because free radicals are a normal part of daily life. Okay, so let's get back to rosemary. So herbalists have long celebrated rosemary for its gentle warming and dispersing effects which brings benefits to the heart, digestion, liver, and mood. And it's often specific for signs of coolness because it's gently warming along with signs of stagnation and of course, inflammation. Rosemary is famous for blending well with meats. And before the widespread use of refrigerators, rosemary was rubbed into meats to prevent them from spoiling. And modern research has shown that rosemary does in fact prolong the quality and shelf life of meats through inhibiting the growth of bacteria. Rosemary also has the ability to reduce the risk of cancer from eating meats that are cooked on high heat. So high heat cooking methods such as pan frying or grilling creates compounds that have been shown to alter DNA and those have been shown to lead to cancer. So in this study, researchers added rosemary extract to meats during cooking, and they found that the high antioxidant content helped prevent the formation of those carcinogenic compounds. So of course, it's gonna be best to avoid meats cooked at high temperatures. I'm not really saying like, you know, go cook lots of meat on high temperatures and then just have rosemary, but it really does illustrate rosemary's protective effects and of course, this assuredly goes beyond just charred meats. Rosemary extracts have also been shown to be helpful against the sun's UV damage, like lemon balm. So of course, we all know the importance of covering up or using safe sunscreens to protect against sunburn. Um, so I'm not saying, again, like I'm not saying go get burnt and then just slather on rosemary, that's not the goal. But the fact is we do get um, sun exposure in our everyday lives. And in this study, researchers showed that taking an extract of rosemary and lemon, and this is interesting, internally, right? It wasn't just used topically, internally, it then decreased UV damage in humans. 
And people taking these extracts, extracts saw really great results after eight weeks and even stronger results after 12 weeks. And I just, I really think this is interesting because it's important to note because basically by including these plants into our lives, by taking them consistently, regularly, then that's helping protect against UV damage on our skin. So that's pretty darn cool. Rosemary is a wonderful ally for the heart. The heart is very susceptible to inflammation and lots of heart disease has that, you know, inflammation as an underlying cause. And rosemary, it can increase circulation, which is always a good thing for the cardiovascular system. And it can also decrease inflammation within the cardiovascular system. Rosemary is famously called the herb of remembrance and has long been used as a symbolic way to remember a loved one or event such as weddings and funerals. It was traditionally used to improve memory and herbalists often recommend that students smell a sprig of rosemary while they're studying and then again while taking their exams to help improve their recall. And I've heard this tradition goes back as far as ancient Greece. And of course, researchers love to look at this stuff and they've since confirmed that smelling rosemary essential oils reduces test anxiety and also significantly enhances memory. Not only does rosemary help with short-term memory, it may also have a role in preventing and addressing Alzheimer's. In one short-term study, as little as a 750 milligram dose, that's less than a gram, of dried rosemary had a significant beneficial effect on cognitive function in an elderly population. And another study showed that Alzheimer's patients experience cognitive benefits simply by smelling the essential oil. So again, like I said with lemon balm, this isn't a cure. I'm not trying to like sell snake oil here, but it's clear that it can be a contributing factor in helping people with this uh, disease. So when we think about dosage, of course, culinary amounts of rosemary is just a great way to enjoy its flavor. A rosemary is great for digestion, promote, you know, as it promotes circulation in the cardiovascular system. It can promote circulation in the digestion as well. Um, so having it in your food, just an enjoyable amount, is a great thing to do regularly. And then if you want, if you're really into experiencing uh, the benefits of rosemary, you can take more of it, like two to four grams up to three times a day as a tea. Uh, and then you can also have it as a tincture. It's often prepared as a dried herb tincture. Um, and you can take it that as well, tincture being an alcohol extract. So there's some considerations. Of course, it's a very safe herb. We use it in cooking all the time, right? Um, if someone is pregnant or doing breastfeeding, you wouldn't want to take huge amounts of it you know, the amount that it's in food is just totally fine. Essential oil is also to be avoided during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Rosemary might lower blood glucose levels. So that's something you might have to monitor if you're taking insulin. Then a cup, you know, very small percentage of people have skin dermatitis when exposed to rosemary. Generally, they know about that. Just like lemon balm, there's so many ways to enjoy the lovely rosemary, whether it's added to food or, you know, simply as a tea. As you can see, these two wonderful mint family plants are full of gifts for helping us address chronic inflammation. And of course, these are just two of the many plants that are out there. And as I was mentioning earlier, if you want to learn more how plants can help you with chronic inflammation, then you can check out the webinar that's going on right now. It's showing later today and tomorrow. I talk about different aspects of inflammation and I also talk about three other plants. So uh, you'll definitely want to check that out. But for now we can, oh, I had a, there's the, the slide for that. But for now we can head back to live video and John and I are gonna head back and we can answer your questions. Get my mouse to work here. There we go. Hi, I was muted there, I'm back. You're muted. Um, <laughs> The only free radicals that I really knew of were my kids. I didn't know there were <laughs> other free radicals uh, who, who could only come from parents like Kimberly and I. Uh, but I will say that lemon balm helped them growing up. I mean, we made the lemon balm popsicles. Kimberly always had that cold lemon balm iced tea in the fridge. That's his sane. Um, and that was um, 
you know, that, that was huge for us, for them growing up. And uh, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, I just want to point out that, you know, just to emphasize, re-emphasize that point you made, Rosalie, that we can't hide from the free, from the free radicals. Like, you can't hide from my children. Um, so, <laughs> and the, the thing is, like, antioxidants, adding antioxidants. And everyone's going to, like, so many people are like, sell you that bottle of capsules that have antioxidants and this and that. And, and, and lemon balm grows so easily in so many places. It's just this weed all over my yard. <laughs> and we, um, you know, use it all the time and it's free and we're getting all those herbs and all those antioxidants in our diet in a lot of different ways. And that's the other t thing too, right, Rosalie, because, um, you know, it's like, oh, I take my antioxidant pills. Well, you want a lot of sources of different kinds of antioxidants and adding it to your food and having it intentionally in your herbs, right, is, is healthier. Yeah, definitely. Because there's, um, you know, these nutraceutical companies who, you know, for a while now, we've known about antioxidants being beneficial. And so, of course, they want to patent, you know, certain antioxidants like resveratrol, people might have heard yeah. about. And they want to patent them and then, you know, sell them as this expensive supplement. But what studies have shown time and time again, that those mm -hmm. isolate, isolated extracts aren't actually beneficial. It really is whole food plant sources. That's because there's not just like one thing that's doing it, right? It's like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So those, you know, those expensive nutraceuticals are really not the way to go with antioxidants. And that's becoming increasingly known now. I mean, we're going to see that become less of a thing that's marketed because study after study is showing, yeah. Not no, good enough. No, right. And look at like lemon balm, rosemary. These are all from the plants you can get at the start. Plant starts you could get your local supermarket <laughs> or co-op often and just put in the ground. And, yeah. and uh, so much easier to grow than vegetables. Um, Such a know. different experience too of like going to the store and getting capsules and, yeah, you know, and like that. I mean, I'm not, I take some capsules. I'm not trying to be totally negative, but I'm just saying like, that's a different experience than like, smelling, you know, seeing the rosemary or lemon balm out there, smelling them, being able to make things that you personally enjoy suited to your own taste. I mean, it's just very mm -hmm. different to, you know, to hold your cup of tea and appreciate in every sip and savor it. It's mm -hmm. just very different. Exactly. Okay, I'm exactly. going. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So just a reminder, everyone, before we get to the questions here that, um, that you want to see the, this full webinar because it's different than what Rosalie was just talking about. It takes a much wider scope. If this interests you, this Facebook and YouTube live that we're doing today, please go to herbwebinar.com. You can pop it up in a new window right now, register. It's happening today. It's happening tomorrow. And um, yes, yeah, what we're here to talk about too. So uh, please do that because it is awesome. I know a lot of people are uh, listen to that. So let's um let's get some questions. And the thing is, folks, when the questions come in, they've been coming in, and um, I'll try, we'll we'll start somewhere, but ask it again. And YouTube, Facebook, folks, uh, we see them all come into one place, so um, we'll answer one. So sometimes you'll be like, I didn't see that question in there. Like if you're on YouTube, it's okay, maybe it came in from Facebook. Um, so let's see. Um, where would you like to start, Rosalie? I feel like there's um. Let's start with this question right here. I just. Because Shonda asked, what are the most beneficial ways to consume rosemary? Start with a question, just picked one. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, we'll take it from there. <laughs> yeah, no, great question from Shonda. Um, I would say the ways that you enjoy it the most is always number one, because I think that when we act from a place of you know true joyfulness and curiosity and inspiration, and when we're thinking about our health, that's the way to go. So I would first say like, what ways do you enjoy rosemary? And definitely do those. And then apart from that, you know, after you make your list there, um, I definitely think it's underrated as a tea. I don't think a lot of people drink rosemary tea. And that's something that I got introduced to when I was in France uh, with my friend Christophe Bernard, who's a wonderful herbalist who loves rosemary. This is like his plant. And it was such a special thing to be in southern France, where it grows, you know, regularly and see Christophe just go on and on about the benefits of the tea. So if you haven't had rosemary tea before, I would highly recommend that. And another way that I have been enjoying it lately is to make what's called an oxymel out of it. And this is how you do it. You take a uh, mason jar and you fill it like a third of the way with dried rosemary. You can probably use fresh here too. I've just only done it with um, dried myself. If you use fresh, you want to use a little bit more. You want to chop it up really well. 
And then you're going to add, like say in a quart jar, about a half cup of honey. And then you're going to fill the jar the rest of the way with uh, raw apple cider vinegar. And then you're going to put a lid on that. You want it to be a non-metal lid because the vinegar will corrode metal. So you want to put a plastic lid or put it in a jar that has a glass top. Or you can put wax paper in between those two layers so that if you are putting on a metal lid, the vinegar doesn't touch the metal. Shake it up really well. Keep it on your counter. Keep shaking, shaking it up for a while. Um, and you'll see you know, the honey and the vinegar and the rosemary all combine. Leave that for about two weeks, strain it off, and now you have what's called an oxymel. Uh, with oxymels, you can take them by the spoonful, and that's often done when there's like chest congestion, so they're used for medicine. But I think this is wonderful to put in cold sparkling water, if you like sparkling water or plain water, if that's your thing. And that is a wonderful way to enjoy it. It's sweet, sour, has the taste of rosemary. It's really cooling. You could also use that to make all sorts of different mocktails uh, if you want to get real inventive. And I, for me, like uh, what I'll do is I, I make uh, maraschino cherries myself. So I'll just like take maraschino cherries, put them on a stick, put them in the glass, put in the oxymel. I use about a tablespoon per like 10 ounces of water. Really depends on your preparation strength and your taste buds. You kind of got to play with that for a little bit but then it's just this super yummy beverage. So mm. I'm thinking of that now as like we're in this heat wave. Oxymels are so cooling. Um, like you really feel like your body temperature, the felt, you know, the felt sense of it is that it's decreased um, when you drink these wonderful beverages. So that could be another way to enjoy them. A rosemary. Wow. That's wonderful. I think I want to make some of that myself. <laughs> A lemon balm question from, from Shay. I'm growing... Uh, lemon balm from seed and so far uh, so 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 good I imagine when, uh, when do you know it's the right time to harvest uh, to pick them to pick lemon balm yeah so wonderful that you have fresh lemon balm that you get to enjoy so what I do is I like to harvest it just before it goes to flower the bees do love it so sometimes I'll harvest like you know, a half or three quarters of it and leave some of it to still go to flower but another great thing about lemon balm is if you you know right as it's going to flower you can kind of chop it down, leaving like this much, a couple of leaves still on the stem, and it'll keep growing. So I can generally get two, sometimes three cuttings off the plant during the growing season. So um, that's a good way. And if, you know, sometimes I don't want to wait until it's just about to flower because I'm ready to use it now. So you can just keep pinching lemon balm. And so if here's the stem, lemon balm will have these like leaf, the leaves, I can't really do that with my fingers, but you have the stem and then the leaves will come off um, opposite sides of the stem. You just go down to like a lower amount of leaves and then pinch it off hmm. or cut it off if you need to, if it's a woodier stem. But basically when you do that, it'll stimulate the growth to keep going. So then it'll kind of like branch out and grow. So lemon balm will actually get bushier and produce more the more you pick it. So don't be afraid to pick it. Hmm. How do you feel about lemon, lemon balm as a glycerite? West uh, Star Tarot asks. Yeah, that, that can be a great preparation for kids because it's very sweet, mm -hmm. uh, which they often like. Mm -hmm. the, the dosage is harder to get, a, you know, glycerite isn't as strong as an extraction and you're generally taking it in a smaller amount. So the amount that you get per dosage is not going to be huge. So I think it's good for kids because they take lower amounts. And it's a taste that they'll like. If mm -hmm. you if you really like glycerides and you like taking herbs like that, definitely experiment with it. See what you think. You know, try it out. Um, I, I think it's worth trying lemon balm or any herb for that matter in all these different ways. So you can really get a sense of the different ways each of these preparations uh, feels for you. Um, because it's it's never really one or the other. You know, like I was saying with lemon balm, you can make a simple tea and see how that makes you feel. You can make a really stronger tea, see how that makes you feel. And then once you know, you know, and of course it's not just one or the other, it's a whole range in between. Once you have that experience, you'll know like, oh, like I need lemon balm and this is what I need right now. And so you'll find that with glycerides. They'll be like, oh, I know this is how I feel when I you know, work with lemon balm as a glyceride and that's what I need right now. But it's worth having, especially that stronger lemon balm, kind of a nourishing infusion where you're using a lot of the herb and steeping it for a long time, it's worth trying it like that so you know how that makes you feel. Because 
So this is my thing like with glycerites, it has a lesser extract, you know, glycerite isn't as strong of an extractor and you're taking a lower dosage. So some people trying lemon balm glycerite for the first time might be like, yeah, I didn't really notice much. Um, mm -hmm. It's a possibility, you know, if there's someone who works better with larger dosages. Um, and so it's just good to like try it in different preparations and different strengths. So you really get a sense of like, oh, this is what lemon balm can do depending on these different preparations. Hmm. Uh, would you take the flowers off of the rosemary when you harvest it? No, no, I just leave them on. And again, with mint family plants, they're often highest in their essential oils or their aromatic qualities just before they flower. Hmm. That doesn't mean that we can't use them after they flower, but that's an interesting thing to, to play around with is to smell mint family plants before they flower and after they flower to get a sense of how their aromatics change. So they're going to be stronger before they go to flower because the plant is still putting its energy into the leaves, right? Then once the plant flowers, it's putting its energy into the flowers. That doesn't mean that all of the aromatics go away from the leaves. I would still use it in flower if I needed to. But we were talking like ideal times. Look for it just before it flowers. Okay. Um, John, you said you guys did a cold lemon balm tea in the summer. I often did res raspberry tea in the summer. Makes me wonder if a combination of those two would be good and maybe with rosemary. What do you think? Sounds lovely to me. Yeah, experiment. All aromatic <laughs> yeah, and herbs you know, and they're all very, you know, well, you know, red raspberry has a more saltier, subdued taste, but, uh, but uh, yeah, you can experiment with all those and probably get a lovely tea. Um, and with all of this heat here, especially on the West Coast, but many of us who are in summer having uh, lots of heat, those cold infused mints are a wonderful way to go. Mm -hmm. And so basically all you do is you could harvest the lemon balm, the rosemary, both other mint family plants. I like to harvest them and just kind of like crush them up a little bit and then put them in a jar, fill that jar with cool water, lukewarm waters from the tap or whatever, however you get your water and then let that sit. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll let that sit for like 24 hours and I'll just put it in the fridge and then the next day, but it can be ready in like a half an hour. Like those aromatics will disperse through the water pretty well. Mm. And then you can strain it off if you want, you don't have to. And then you can drink that. And basically it's going to lightly flavor your water in a way that I find really appealing and just lovely and cooling during these hot, hot days. So that's one way. In terms of like a therapeutic dosage, this is going to be a less like medicinal preparation, but can be very wonderfully therapeutic in that it's cooling, it's hydrating, it's calming. Um, I pretty much always do this because I have lemon balm growing, you know, during the growing season, it starts early, stays late. So I often do this when I travel, which the only travel I've done in the past year has actually been to go see John last, last <laughs> September. Um, and I did it then, but I oh. often... Um, <laughs> do that. So I'll take the lemon balm and crush it and put it in like a thing with a straw so I can drink it while I'm driving. And of course, it's just nice for like travel jitters. And, you know, like sometimes my belly yeah. will be a little upset when I'm traveling. And it just is like, it just, it like ameliorates all that. Like I know if I have my lemon balm, cold infused water, I'm hydrated, I'm calmer, feeling great, then I can show up at John's with a smile on my face. <laughs> and the anxiety of just hanging out with me in general. Right. It's prep. <laughs> it's prep for that. <laughs> you're a saint you're a saint you know, you know uh, actually one of my first lemon ball memories you know way back in the day john we're talking like i don't know we're getting close to 20 years here now not quite but close is you were in acupuncture school which was while you were working full-time while yeah. you had kids and you were drinking those lemon ball nourishing infusions you know a lot and i remember that those were like your lifeline so yeah I often associate lemon balm with you Absolutely. And that's still true. Uh, we have all this fresh lemon balm and all summer. Um, I just drink that um, cold, like we, it's like making an infusion with a fresh plant and two in a, over here, in a, in a like a half a, a gallon mason jar. And then just um, keep the lemon balm in there. <laughs> just keep it in the fridge. And it's, I mean, if you had that in the fridge next to some ice water and you try both it is a great exercise to yeah. understand the feeling of what cooling energetics can, can do for you because there's a big difference between just taking that water and then taking the lemon balm water it's a great experiment and um if you just keep that growing in your garden and keep cutting it and it'll keep growing all summer and um yeah it's a that's a great exercise to understand that whole taste of herbs and everything mm -hmm. yeah 
Absolutely. Um, there's been this question here that, uh, uh, from either from either presentation that you did, which herbs might mm -hmm. be either for gut inflammation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the digestive system can be very sensitive to inflammation, whether that's like something that, it, you know, like gets diagnosed as a disease later on, or it's just like your general daily disturbance of gut inflammation. And there's a like so many herbs that can help with that. And so sometimes it is a matter of trying different plants to see which ones have a special affinity to you. Um, cause there's not really that one plant and kind of like I was saying, like, sometimes you might want lemon balm strong, or sometimes you want, you know, less strong. There might be certain plants that help, you know, at different times of the day or just whatever it's going on. So some of my favorites are lemon balm. That is a lovely one. Um, and that is, I don't want to open up too big of a can of worms, but mm -hmm. as we've been talking about, it's cooling. So that's helpful if somebody has signs of heat in their digestive tract. Rosemary is also wonderful for gut inflammation. It's a bit warming, not overly so, but that's nice if there's signs of stagnation and coolness in the digestive tract. Mm. There's, of course, turmeric is very famous for both gut health and for inflammation. And turmeric is slightly astringent. So if there's lax tissues, it can help tighten and tone tissues, uh, which is often used for things like ulcers. Uh, plantain is one of my favorite, it's called vulnerary herbs or wound healing herbs. And when there's inflammation in the digestive tract, those mucous membranes are so sensitive that they can, you know, have these like minor wounds or, um, irritations going on. So plantain is wonderfully soothing for that. And then I like to combine plantain with aromatic herbs that are also lovely for digestion. Things like fennel is wonderful. Uh, another favorite is chamomile. I don't think chamomile always gets the respect it deserves when it mm. comes to digestive inflammation and just modulating inflammation in general. And that's a wonderful you know, um, bitter plant. So that bitter is helping to address digestion. So, I mean, it's pretty much like any, and then I could also just open it up really big and say pretty much any herb in your culinary cabinet <laughs> is going to be wonderful um, because so many of them are really high in antioxidants so I'm talking things like basil, oregano, thyme, all mm. of those are really wonderful. And um, one thing that I like to preach is that our meals and our foods, our meals and our beverages should be mm. chock full of our wonderful healing plants. Of course, we want it to taste good. I'm not saying like add so much stuff that you're like, Ugh. Um, but you can add them to every single meal, to every single beverage. And through that, I mean, that's some of the best food is medicine, right? Because it you just can't compare taking a couple like squirts of a tincture or glycerite that just doesn't compare to getting, you know, two to three meals a day or three beverages a day that are just filled with these wonderful plants. I mean, you're just, you know, the amount you're taking, the duration, the consistency, that's going to be the best medicine really. Mm, that's, 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 that's wonderful. And, 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 and that's the thing to remember is in some sense it's like, Oh, I, you know, I want to learn about herbs. I want to, um, you know, start using them for healing purposes, not realizing that this most of the very same herbs, if not all the ones that you've planted for culinary reasons that might or or that you can easily access at your friend's garden they might have or a local farm or something, you know, you can experiment with that rosemary uh, to harvest in a few sprigs. You know, you can you can start using those fresh aromatic plants and uh, bringing those antioxidants, those anti-inflammatory herbs in. Because, um, uh, but, but Alison Consala has also asked like, is it best to use lemon balm for a tea with fresh or dried herb? And, mm -hmm. and so not everyone will gonna have that fresh herb growing. Mm -hmm. So we keep emphasizing the fresh, but you can use a dry too, right? Yeah, and they're very different preparations. The fresh just has, it has a very different flavor. I love it in the summer months. It's so cooling and delicious. But when we dry plants, we actually help by drying them, it breaks open their cell walls and makes them easier to extract. So oftentimes we can actually get a stronger preparation with dried plants than we can fresh. But I don't want to make it sound like one is better or worse than the other. They're just different. So work with what you have. If yeah. you have both, try both. If you only have one, don't, I mean, I guess in that, if you only have dry, don't feel bad. You don't have fresh look for it, you know, in your life, you, you never know where you're going to come across it. But, you know, don't, 
I, I admit that I used to kind of like poo poo dried lemon balm for a while. And I think mm -hmm. it's because I'd only had like bad quality yeah. <laughs> dried lemon mm -hmm. balm. But now I drink it. I mean, I grow as much as I can in my garden so I can dry it. And so I have enough all winter long. And this year I didn't have enough and I ended up buying some from our friends at Mountain Rose oh, wow. Herbs because I can't go without it. And so yeah. I drink a lot of dried lemon balm tea um, throughout the year. So yeah, try it all the ways. Yeah, and we always keep talking about fresh a lot too because one of our goals, Rosalie and I, is to get folks outside connecting to nature and that's a big part of the healing process. It's yes, there's a part about healing and what it's doing for our bodies, but don't forget the fact that when we connect with nature and go outside, that's really healing and that's really good for stress and inflammation too because if we go to the root of inflammation, it's often stress and then stress can often be helped by just spending time outdoors and taking mm -hmm. gardening and taking walks. So the medicine isn't always in that chemical constituent. It's also in the process of being, you know, engaging with, with plants or being outside. So yeah. true. Yeah. So true. So true. So uh, Oxymel question, a couple of folks asking, including uh, Donna, uh, but could you make an Oxymel with lemon balm? It yes. seems like they're often made with the resinous herbs. They are often used with resinous herbs, especially when they're specifically being used for medicine for the respiratory system, like cold congestion in the respiratory system. So if you have that like boggy wet cough, then oxymels are kind of a specific preparation for that. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about wonderfully, um, you know, wonderful beverages that we just get to bring into our lives and enjoy the benefits from that, there's pretty much you know, every plant we can make an oxymel out of it. It's more commonly done with those aromatic plants for sure. But yeah, so lemon balm, oxymel, absolutely. My favorite oxymel is Tulsi. Although I think, you know, just changes all the time, but I love Tulsi hibiscus oxymel. That's wonderfully cooling, wonderful for modulating inflammation as well. And there is a recipe on the Learning Herbs blog that has mm. that recipe in there as well. So yeah, mm. there's endless possibilities with the oxymels. <laughs> And uh, when making, uh, Charlene would like to know, when making a tea um, or in water, do you chop the lemon balm leaves up before steeping? Good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, the more surface of the plant we can expose, the better. So uh, admittedly, like sometimes I just kind of take the lazy way out and I just like go like this and I crush the leaves and then put them into water. Like if I'm just doing a quick cold infusion, but really, you know, if you're using what I'll do when I'm using dried lemon balm, is before I put it in, I'll just like kind of, you know, rub it together to get the more cell walls exposed. And same with plant, you know, or the fresh plant, just chop it up really finely before you put it mm -hmm. in. And that'll help make a stronger tea for sure. Great mm -hmm. question. And there's this question here that Violet asked about, have you ever created essential oils with your aromatic herbs? And put that question up too, because I think this is, um, I think a lot of folks, maybe they're starting out or um, um, maybe like learn about that you can use fresh herbs through maybe starting with their friend introducing the new essential oil or something. So maybe me good Rosalie to like say, okay, what is this difference and you mm -hmm. know, why, you know, whole plants are what we're mm -hmm. talking about and why. Yeah. A lot of people are really getting into making their own essential oils. And mm -hmm. to do that, you need some kind of expensive equipment, like mm -hmm. a copper still. Um, and then you need a ton of plant material. And I don't mean that like literally, but almost. <laughs> and oh, those of you who know, <laughs> yeah, you'll need a lot to make a very little amount of the essential oil. And some of you might be familiar with Melissa, which is what we commonly call lemon balm essential oil. Mm -hmm. You'll know that like a teeny tiny bit costs an extraordinary amount. And that's because it takes like John was showing like a room full of lemon balm to make just a tiny bit of the essential oil. So there's some drawbacks to that um, in that regard. So I personally, I don't make essential oils. I love more working with the whole plant. Like that's just my calling. I like that, you know, being able to make things easily without expensive equipment. And, but I know, you know, some people are, are really into making their own essential oils. I think that's a, a fun endeavor to go down if, if you're in, you know, if you have access to a lot of plants and you don't mind spending a lot of money on equipment. <laughs> Kind of the, two, the two drawbacks there. <laughs> <laughs> um, is lemon balm safe to drink daily? Amy asks. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. There is, you know, that somewhat concern, you know, if somebody has hypothyroidism, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing in terms of just like, we don't really know, like, 
let me see how to say this. We would really know about lemon balm's effect on the thyroid if we had a study that was like took 2000 people and half the people drank lemon with hypothyroidism drank a lemon balm tea every day and half didn't and they tested them before and after. But we're never going to have that study because they don't they won't do that, right? It's unethical to test to see if herbs cause harm, right? So that's not going to happen. Um, but again, as I was saying before, it, it seems very unlikely that for most people with hypothyroidism that it's going to be an issue. I have heard from some people who, you know, they swear that it, do, it did them harm, but we also know that there's many people it doesn't do harm. So that'd be the one thing, like if somebody had hypothyroidism, I may not tell them like drink a strong lemon balm tea day in and day out. Or if they did want to do that, I would just say, you know, be cognizant of things and, and you know, keep regular visits with your doctor, measure things and see how it goes. And, you know, a lot of people don't find it to be a problem. So that's mm. the only thing, you know, other than that, we're talking about a very safe plant that, um, I mean, I go for months drinking it every day, simply out of enjoyment, because it's one of my favorite plants to drink tea of. So we'll do a couple more questions. And I um, just want to make sure everyone signs up for Rosalie's webinar at herbwebinar.com. That's simple. You, if you're on the computer, you can sign up on your phone or open a new web browser or do a different web browser. Why you're, why we're, why you're thinking about it? Herbwebinar.com today and tomorrow, Rosalie's doing like, if you enjoyed the short presentation we did earlier, it's a different presentation and it's longer. It's probably like an hour, or so, I'm guessing, Rosalie. 15, it's 50 minutes. So, 50 minutes. Perfect so, amount of time. <laughs> perfect amount of time. And it's the perfect amount of time and the great information that will go a lot deeper into inflammation and cooling information. Let me ask you, Rosalie, like, like uh, you know, why, why? Do we want to use herbs for inflammation versus taking a uh, medication or like what is the reason why you put this webinar together? Like, like that point you wanted to get across. Mm -hmm. Well, inflammation has long been of interest to me because for many years I was a clinical herbalist and I specifically worked with people who had chronic illness. And I, you know, as I worked with more and more people, I really began to see that, oh, Chronic inflammation is really such an underlying cause of so many of these problems. And as I said before, Western medicine is really not doing a good job with this because they want to find, you know, like the pill that solves everything without actually addressing the root cause, uh, which is inflammation. So they're kind of suppressing symptoms instead of actually dealing with the root cause. And so it's a long bit of interest to me. Those of you who know me well will know, like I write about it in my books. I talk about it in my YouTube videos. I talk about it in my articles on learning herbs. I'm often mentioning how important it is to modulate inflammation. Then in this past year, that became an even bigger concern than it already was, which is like saying a lot because, right, that's no small thing that chronic inflammation is the root cause of most chronic diseases. That's, that's no small thing. But it became an even bigger concern because we saw that people who were getting uh, COVID and had the worst outcomes were people who already had high levels of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And it was increasingly frustrated to me to see, you know, art just people trying to address it, but it was just done in ways that were just so disappointing to me. Like I'd read articles from the Western medicine field and they'd say, you know, like we have to address, like they knew, right? It's not like people don't know. I said, we know. They'd say, well, like I read this one article that was especially frustrating to me because it was just like the doctor, I could just like see the doctor in their lab white lab coat, like shaking their finger. And I was like, people have to eat better and exercise more. And I'm like, great. If that worked, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> but like saying that, you know, it's just not helping. And then um, as I, I started to think like, oh, you know, like I have so much to share on inflammation really, you know, I'm really, really called to share about this on inflammation. I'll go do a bunch of reading, you know, and see kind of like what functional medicine and alternative health medicine is saying about inflammation. And oh, that's depressing. I mean, they have like a more holistic approach than like Western medicine that says like eat right or take this pill. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's so full of fear and judgment and shame. And I just feel like there's this like so much of like how alternative um, medicine is approaching it is kind of like this, like, you know, person sitting on a yoga mat in the middle of the park, dressed in white with their kale smoothie, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, like that's like what everyone is trying to attain. 
And I'm just thinking like, how do we make inflammation, addressing inflammation, like a reality that's going to work for people in a way that's not based on fear, that's not based on suppressing symptoms, but is actually joyful. And that isn't about our world getting smaller and smaller because when alternative health world, it's like, you know, it's like every day there's like, oh, this is toxic. That's toxic. That's a pollutant. That's a carcinogen. And it's just kind of like, you know, you feel it's like, oh, I can't even eat food now, you know, or, you know, I can't go anywhere. And you see these people who are just completely fearful of, of regular things, right? I'm not saying like that we should be bathing in a toxic waste dump, <laughs> but I'm, there's, you know, there's a, there's like a, a scale here, right? And I just see more and more that like fear is leading people to be afraid of daily life. Mm. So um, herbs are really a way that our lives can get bigger. And I'll, here's a great, here's a very practical, tangible example. Within alternative health, pretty much everyone, the first stage to addressing chronic inflammation is to do food elimination. Mm. Sometimes food elimination is necessary. I'm not saying that it's never necessary, but I think like in the scheme of things, if this is zero to a hundred right now, the alternative health world, it's like, you know, a hundred percent of the time we have to eliminate all these foods and all these foods that we've been eating for so long are suddenly toxic. Well, what I see missing from this situation, well, and then what happens is people, they get rid of this food, they get rid of this food, they get this rid of this food. And there's some really interesting studies looking on it, like um, neural training, it's like the more we reduce foods, the more we're teaching our body to eat less foods. And that's why you'll see people, they start with one food and then another and then another and then another. And I saw this in clinical practice, some to the extreme. I worked with people who could eat like three foods, you know, yeah. like they're eating yeah. like rice, um, and chicken. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it's just horrible. So my approach is by working with herbs, instead of eliminating foods first, is that we heal our digestion. So somebody was asking about inflammation in the digestive tract. Let's heal our digestion. Let's, you know, address inflammation with herbs. Let's strengthen our digestion by doing things like bitters. Bitters help to like literally rev up our digestive system and help like train our digestive system. Let's work with fiber. Fiber is amazing. Fiber is like the most underrated thing for digestion. We start small if somebody's not already getting a lot of fiber, then you need lots of different kinds of fiber. I don't mean like soluble and insoluble. I mean like plants are filled with all sorts of fibers. We need to get lots of fibers in because what that does is it creates a healthy gut flora. That is the best way, way better than taking expensive probiotics to get a healthy gut flora, which is critical to digestive mm. health. Wow. So it's like we're, you know, so we, we don't just say like, get rid of this, get rid of that, get rid of this, and then have people, you know, living a smaller and smaller life. We're saying like, okay, let's train. Let's heal the digestive tract. Let's train it to be stronger. Um, let's train it to eat a wide variety of foods. That's just a way better outcome. Right. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's like if let's say somebody wants to be strong and they walk into a gym and they try to pick up a 50 pound dumbbell or whatever. And they like can't, you know, it's like, <clears throat> and they can't really do it. We don't tell them like, oh, you can't do that. Don't, don't do that you know, go back home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't do that. We say like, here's a five pound dumbbell. Let's get started. And right. then, you know, we work up to it, right? Same thing with so many of our health things. Like instead of eliminating it, we're saying like, let's, let's build something stronger. And herbs mm -hmm. are the perfect companion for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know what you asked me, but I feel oh, like yeah. no, that really is good wonderful so way. Of, I don't agree <laughs> with that too, because when I, when I had a recent health issues a couple of um, years back that had to do that where I had um, some acid reflux, it was really affecting things. Um, for me, uh, you know, it's working not just with the herbs, but working at the root cause of why is there acid reflux in the first place? It was a lot of stress and anxiety. So then I was working on that, but it wasn't just about what I was eating and all. There was therapy. There was all kinds of things that was helping me get, you know, deal and cope with, uh, with the, the underlying issues. But when I was working on that along with the diet and herbs, um, and exercise, all these things together synergistically helped it so that when I got a symptom taken care of recently, a couple months ago, um, they looked at his scope and they were just like, yeah, there's your, everything looks really good. And I was like, cool, <laughs> you know? And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just what's that pill. What's that, you know, even just what's that herb. There's more to it. 
And mm -hmm. I love what you said and Rosalie just now, and I think that's the perfect note to end on. I just want to re remind everyone that there's, uh, if you want to go deeper into this and take that next step, it's a free webinar. Just go to herbwebinar.com. It's playing today. Uh, it's got a couple more showings today in your time zone, convenient times, as well as all day tomorrow. And, um, and, and so I would highly suggest signing up for that. It's free. Go right there. And Rosalie will tell you lots more. And, um, and I also just want to give a shout out to that. Uh, you can uh, listen to Rosalie on her podcast, Herbs with Rosalie. It's a new podcast. Rock yeah, it. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Subscribe to her YouTube channel and just Google her. She'll find her. She's everywhere. Um, <laughs> So I, and I thank you all for joining us here on this uh, Facebook and YouTube live on this Herb Mentor Live. Uh, most of you on here are mentor members. I really appreciate you. And I, Rosalie, I just thank you so much for taking the time today of your busy uh, schedule to come in and, and join all us Herb Mentor folks today. Uh, you've been a big part of Herb Mentor since it started like 13 years ago or something. And I'm so grateful that you're still uh, with us, helping us out, answering our questions and, and, and sharing this incredible information with us. So Thank you very much, Rosalie. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Obviously, I was fired up to be here. It's a topic very close to my heart. And mm. I'm just really grateful, like you said, that all of you wonderful folks are out there um, spreading the herbal love. And and um, yeah, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun if it was just John and I. So <laughs> thanks, everyone. For being Wait, what are you saying? We couldn't, well, <laughs> couldn't do it without all of you, even you, John. <laughs> I hope I hope you all have a wonderful and cool weekend um, and really appreciate you all being here. So have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>